Hello and welcome back to CST2120. So in this lecture I'm going to introduce the module. So I'm going to start with a little bit about me, my research, talk about, then I'm going to talk about the expectations um, that you can have from me studying this module and that I'll have from you. I'm going to briefly discuss the contents of this course, how the course can be taught, the resources available for you as you study on this course, say a little bit about the two uh, pieces of coursework on this course, and then finally I'll conclude with some just a brief discussion of the use of AI tools on this course. Yeah. All right, a little bit about me. So I've done sort of quite a bit of different kinds of research over the years, mostly focusing in the area of AI and different kinds of AI. So, so these are sort of, you know, loose summary of topics, measurement intelligence, first person foundation models, philosophy and science of consciousness, spike neural networks, robotics, and agent systems. So I'll just say a little bit about each to give you an idea of, you know, my background, yeah? So I'm currently working on a new universal measure of intelligence. The idea is that intelligence is linked to prediction, and that if we can measure intelligence in this way, we should be able to compare the intelligence of humans, animals, and AIs, right? There's a lot of talk about, you know, super intelligence and all this kind of stuff, but no one has a way of measuring uh, the intelligence of an AI at the moment, not, in my opinion, very plausible way anyway. And so that's what I've been trying to, be the problem I've been trying to address with this research, yeah? If you're interested, uh, I've put together a, a sort of website dedicated to this research with some experiments and a couple of papers if, in it as well, yeah? This is sort of a more recent area for me. Um, there's obviously a big explosion of uh, foundation models, and foundation model is just a, a sort of word to describe large neural networks that are powering systems like ChatGPT, DALI, Copilot, and so on and so forth, yeah? It's like a generic umbrella term because large language models only refers to language models, whereas a lot of these things are multimodal now, yeah? Now, being sort of just at the early stages of developing an idea for a new type of foundation model that doesn't just reproduce text, but actually reproduces how people feel about um, what they're perceiving. Yeah. So if I see, you know, a picture of a friend, you know, I have a positive emotional reaction. If I see a picture of, I don't know, an orc in Lord of the Rings or something, then I have like a negative emotional reaction. So the idea is to kind of build foundation, a found new type of foundation model called a first person foundation model uh, that reproduces these reactions. Could be using lots and lots of applications for this, recommendation systems, dating, personality models, and so on and so forth, yeah? So I made a start on this. Um, last year I ran an undergraduate project um, by DNS there, um, who built a recording rig that can capture what you're seeing, and then he used EEG and GSR to measure your, his emotional reactions to what he was seeing. So that's like the start, and then sort of looking forward the next year or two, I'm planning to you know put together a startup that can raise money to store d enough data um, and then eventually train train the model. A lot of AI going into this with Amazon Web Services and so on. I've done a lot of work on human and machine consciousness, um, and if you're interested, you can take a look at my book, which is available for free online. It's again quite relevant in the era when we're talking about conscious machines and you know whether ChatGPT is conscious and all this kind of stuff. I spent quite a long number of years working on uh, biologically inspired neural networks. These are neural networks that are trying to mimic what's going on inside your brain with the idea that we could kind of build smarter AIs by building these kind of networks. And Chris Hike and this department still working in this area. So I built this sort of neural simulation modeling tool called SpikeStream as well as a few other things. I've also worked on agent systems quite a bit over the years. I worked on the Safeguard project for two and a half years at uh, Queen Mary University of London, where we were kind of trying to protect, you know, build an agent system that could protect critical infrastructures against tax failure and accidents. This again is becoming a lot more relevant these days. You know, with sort of Russian hackers allegedly trying to, you know, open the Hoover Dam and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I use a similar architecture to build kind of a sort of uh, not quite generative system, but a system that you know automatically. Uh, produces music according to parameters that you set. This is what I call this MIDI agent system. I did a similar thing with agent with uh, generate using agents to generate pictures kind of thing. Yeah. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, take a look at davidgammers.eu, which has more information about these these areas of research. Very happy to supervise final year undergraduate projects on these topics, and I often supervise AI projects, you know, using AI and cloud technology. I think last year we had someone did automatic captioning of YouTube videos. I've had people to build kind of recommendation systems. Had people. I don't know, build a smart mirror that told you how attractive you were. You know, lot, lots of different ideas, prediction, uh, machine learning projects, that kind of stuff, yeah? So I, I generally circulate a list of project ideas, which Jan, who runs the undergraduate module, um, you know, will also circulate uh, for you. Um, and more than happy to have a chat about any ideas you've got using AI, cloud technology, that kind of stuff, yeah? 
sort of quite a few years ago now, about 15 years ago, I did actually do have commercial web experience. So I thought it was worth putting in because I did learn a lot about web commercial web development. I worked at Trinity Mirror and back then they owned all these kind of different websites like the Birmingham Post, the Liverpool Echo. I did sort of back-end development work using this awful language called Cold Fusion, Serverless, JavaScript, SOAP, Ajax and this kind of stuff. Yeah. So technology's moved on, but I did learn a lot of stuff about commercial development um, when I worked there. If you need to get in touch, you're very welcome. Um, so my email address is there. I'm in TG03 on the ground floor of the town hall building. I'm not often there, except when I'm teaching. So, you know, and then I'm not there as well. So, um, you know, don't, I wouldn't recommend just dropping in in the hope of finding me. I'll only be there during my office hours, um, which are listed on the course website. Otherwise, just drop me an email for an appointment, yeah? Okay, so expectations. So what you can expect from me is that I'll be professional and polite, do my best to do that, yeah? I'm available by appointment, either online or face-to-face. -face. Um, usually face-to-face, -face constrained by you know my you know teaching and all this kind of stuff. I always try and respond to emails within two working days in term time. Yeah, and two working days means you know days when I'm working. Yeah, obviously I don't work at the weekend. So if you send me an email on Friday, I'll get back to you on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm not going to get back to you on Saturday morning or something. Yeah, so you know be realistic about this. Don't send me an email on Sunday saying why haven't you replied to my email because I only work you know Monday to Friday usually. I might occasionally work at the weekends and that's fine, but don't expect that. Yeah, we we are constrained uh, at Middlesex University you know, by our regulations, whatever, to mark coursework in 15 working days. Again, it's working days, not calendar days. I do my very best to provide, you know, relevant and clear course materials and exercises and well-specified assessment tasks and marking criteria. So obviously hold me to account if I fall short on any of these points, yeah? Don't expect me to remember your name. I'm bad at that. I don't often not actually told people's names in the labs. So just bear with me on this, yeah? This is a broad course, covers a lot of different technologies. You're going to have to figure stuff out for yourselves. We can't spoon feed you everything. This is, you know, a, you know, university level course. You've got to look up things yourself, you know, talk to each other, ask, drop into the online Q&A session um, if you've got specific questions. We're there to help you, but we're not going to teach you everything. Yeah, you're not going to just, you know, we're not going to pass everything, you know, place everything inside your mind without any effort on your part. Yeah. Now, this cuts both ways, these expectations, right? So what I expect from you is to be professional and polite. Yeah, you're undergraduates, soon going to be going into the workplace. You know, learn as a matter of course, you know, you know, not to behave like school children, right? Which are most vast majority of undergraduates don't anyway. But just think of this as a sort of more of a workplace environment. And I'm expecting you to be professional and polite in that workplace, yeah? Please behave appropriately during teaching sessions. Don't talk when I'm trying to talk to you. Um, you know, don't talk to each other about irrelevant topics. I'm going to have a little bit to say about that later. And please tell me what, you know, what, you know, what works for you and what doesn't work for you on this module. Yeah. I'm always trying to improve it. If I can improve it, I will. Um, so tell me, you know, what is, is not working. And please do the coursework and hand it in on time or you will fail and we'll have a messy reset process, which none of us will enjoy. Yeah. I have had issues in the past with people talking during lectures and laboratory sessions, loud talking in laboratory sessions, talking about irrelevant topics in laboratory sessions. Uh, I don't tolerate this stuff, yeah? Um, so firstly, it means if you're talking about the football during a lab session, you're not learning anything. But what's worse is that, you know, the people around you can't focus on what they're doing either because they've got, you know, you're talking in their ear about, you know, Manchester City or whatever, yeah? So I don't tolerate it, um, you know, because it's bad for you and it's bad for the people around you, yeah? makes it difficult for other students to learn. So just if you want to talk to your mates, I do not care if you go out with your mates and have a coffee in the quad. Yeah, that's completely fine. Then you're only losing your learning and you're not disrupting other people, yeah? But if you persist in, you know, talking in laboratory sessions about any topic topics or talking loudly, I'm going to warn you. And if you continue to behave in that way, I'm going to ask you to leave, yeah? It doesn't often come to that, but it has come to that occasionally. And I will absolutely enforce that in my laboratory sessions. I'm going to ask the other teachers to do the same, yeah? Okay, what are we going to teach? Well, it's web development, yeah, which is super, you know, contemporary, right? We're focusing here on kind of uh, uh, web pages running in the browser, but actually it's the same technology that's used to develop apps as well. So it's really not that difficult to use exactly the same thing as, you know, JavaScript, maybe some package like React, and then build a web service at the back end. Uh, and this is just generic way in which a whole load of stuff works, you know, including te cloud technology, right? I'm teaching web services, 
Amazon Web Services is just a bunch of web services. I don't know much about the Google or Azure offerings, but I imagine they're roughly the same thing, yeah? So teaching you how the front and back end of websites work, also databases, ubiquitous in you know the modern technology world, right? I'm gonna use MongoDB because it's all kind of JSON based, but we'll come to that later. So, you, and what this course is really about is practical experience developing websites. It's like hand-on coding, practical projects, fun stuff, I think. Um, and it's very relevant to the commercial world, yeah? So I think it's, I enjoy writing code for web development and I hope you will too. And so you really should, you know, try and have some fun on this course, yeah? Because after all, you know, we might all might die of, you know, some meteorite strike tomorrow. And if you haven't had fun on this course, then, you know, you kind of lost something you could have had. Yeah, so don't just think about career or think about grades. Just, you know, this is quite cool stuff you're learning here, yeah? So I've done a couple of website design, all the client side stuff like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, JSON, and Ajax. And then the server side stuff, you know, what the, you've got a client, a server, client's talking to the server. The server in your case will be web services built with Node.js and MongoDB. So, you know, as a sort of generic thing, you're learning client technology, client and server technologies and data storage and retrieval with a database, yeah? And you're gonna basically, as I said, it's hands-on, you're gonna learn these technologies, you're gonna develop dynamic websites and uh, using a database and web services. It's a little bit beyond that as well. It's not just practical because I am asking you to write a report and do a video demonstration. And I think, you know, these kind of ability to communicate what you've done, write a well-formatted, clear technical report are important and will help you kind of, you know, it, when you actually move into the workplace, yeah? So there's quite a few jobs that this 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 uh, module's aiming at. Obviously, the, the most obvious one is a web developer, um, but also an app developer. I've said because the back end of a lot of apps is just a web service, which and you have a single web service, and that web service will talk to the front end website, it'll talk to an app, and it'll also talk to um, the sort of back end systems, the content management systems that are used by the company. Yeah. So this kind of architecture is used by both web development and apps, and you can actually write apps in JavaScript now. Um, but maybe you turn out, you know, it turns out that programming is just not your thing, yeah? And that's often often the case. I find people sort of start with computer science and they realize, well, I, you know, I really just don't like programming, yeah? They can pass the course, but they don't want to do that as their career, and that's completely fine, yeah? But there is a lot of money to be made in technical recruitment. Sort of, when I've applied for jobs in the past, um, it seems that uh, there's often companies will hire a recruiter to serve as sort of middleman and sort of filter out a lot of the application applicants and then they'll pass a certain number of applicants to the company in exchange for that service. If they hire one of those applicants, they'll pay the recruiter like three months salary, something like that. Yeah. So there's quite a good money in that. And you could be a better technical recruiter if you um, actually understand the technologies you're recruiting. Yeah. So there's, you know, that's another option if you don't like coding. Um, there's quite a lot of jobs for companies like Salesforce of kind of customizing and sort of delivering software, which I should have put on here, but that's also, you know, potentially another job you could look into after doing this module. And obviously, if you're managing a team of people who are doing, you know, technical technological stuff, if you understand technology, you can do a better job of managing them, yeah? This is slightly old, but just to have a skim on techno jobs or CW jobs or one of these kind of techno technological uh, recruitment pages, and you'll see there's a lot of web developer jobs. I think JavaScript came up as like roughly comes up as 100 pages of jobs, which 10, 10 jobs per page, that's like a thousand jobs, yeah? Obviously, you know, you'll be looking at entry level jobs, but I think that JavaScript, web services, JSON, MongoDB, this kind of stuff would be very useful for applying for the kind of, you know, early stage developer jobs when you leave uh, Middlesex. If you want to set yourself up for a good chance to get these jobs, because they are competitive, right? A lot of computer science graduates coming out. You need to demonstrate that you can actually work with the tech with the technologies that you want to that you're applying for, yeah. And the way you do this usually is you you show the employer examples of the work you've done, yeah. So your coursework could form part of your portfolio, right? You could put your website on a public URL. You could put links to websites and GitHub repositories on your CV, and then you're actually demonstrating to employers. Um, that you've got the skills to do that they need, yeah. And so, uh, so when you're doing these projects, obviously you're thinking about your grade, but also think about your portfolio, yeah. That's a really important thing with technological recruitment. It won't matter about getting through the door, but when you get to the interview stage, um, that's when they'll care about this stuff, yeah. Okay, so how's this module taught? Well, at Handon, we've got what I'm calling our kind of blended learning approach, yeah. So I make videos available online, like this one. Um, uh, that you should watch before the laboratory sessions. 
And then what we're doing with this module under the new learning framework is, a, is two two-hour laboratory sessions per week. These are delivered face-to-face -face on campus, can't join it online, and we've got two types of session. Yeah, We've got a taught laboratory session, and that's a combination of the teacher showing you stuff, okay, doing some coding demonstrations, that kind of thing, and then you, students, um, have a chance, you know, to actually do that stuff yourself with support from the teacher and any student learning assistance we have, yeah? So you've kind of got a teaching, learning, and applying, and then another, maybe a bit more teaching, a bit more learning and applying, yeah? So that's very much a guided, um, you know, teaching through the technologies that, um, on this course, yeah? And then we have a second laboratory session in the week, another two hours, which is more of a support laboratory session where you work independently, but with help from the teacher and the student learning assistants. Yeah, so maybe you're going to work on your coursework in that sort of laboratory session, um, or maybe you're going to do some tutorials on JavaScript or HTML or this kind of stuff. Yeah. So those are the, and these are these four hours of labs delivered face to face on campus every week. In addition to that, we've got a two hour Q&A session that's delivered line, live online every week with Zoom. And this is, there's no teaching component in this. It's more like here, I'll be as a, your module leader on Zoom and you can drop in and have a one-to-one -one conversation about your coursework, help you install software, you know, ask any questions that you've got. Um, anything you like really can, you know, depending on numbers can usually give people about 10 minutes. So people can just drop in and have a one-to-one -one conversation with me during that two hour slot, yeah? Other campuses in Dubai and Mauritius might have a slightly different approach, but this is how we're going to do it at Hendon. So to explain how that works, I've got a separate video, um, which is available in the blended learning section of the course website, and it's also one of the videos I'm asking you to watch in the first week of term, yeah? This is a practical course, right? I'm trying to teach you how to do stuff, yeah? So it's really important that you watch the week's videos before the laboratory sessions. You're just going to waste your time in the laboratory sessions if you're watching the videos in them, particularly in the taught ones, yeah? If you don't turn up to the taught laboratory session having watched the video, you're kind of going to be wasting your time. You know, you can probably muddle along, but your learning is going to be, you know, you're going to be missing all the information that the other students have. Yeah, and you must turn up to the taught laboratory session on time. Yeah, because it's a structured session with 30 minutes teaching, 30 minutes, you know, practical exercises, 30 minutes teaching, and so on. Um, so obviously, if you're missing the first 15 minutes, then you're going to be, you know, in on catch up mode, and that's going to be difficult for you. Yeah. I strongly recommend that everyone attends the support laboratory sessions. Yeah, that's when they can have a one-to-one -one conversation to monitor your progress on the course and help you with that, yeah, and give you feedback about your coursework, yeah? The taught laboratory sessions, I'd recommend to most people. The only exception would be if you already got a lot of experience with some technologies, maybe you'll find that you're wasting your time in the taught laboratory sessions. In that case, just turn up to the ones where the technology is new to you and just you can ignore or turn, you can turn up to them, but of course, but, you know, you may not find them as useful, yeah, and you can maybe just get on with your own work, yeah? The online Q&A sessions are definitely optional. Only turn up to them if you've got a question or need help with something or, some, or want to talk to me one-to-one, -one, yeah? Right, so the module website is the sort of core of this course, yeah? It's got the course like description, software, links to videos, video slides, laboratory handouts, example code, and other resources, yeah? Everything is hopefully there for you to study on this module and you, you know, make sure you've got access to it and let me know if you have any problems accessing these resources. So this is the module website, I'll give you a quick tour in a sec. Now, course books, um, I found a couple of good online resources for learning JavaScript, because this module has HTML, CSS, it has MongoDB, but the core of it is JavaScript prog and programming in JavaScript, yeah? So these are a couple of books. Now, this one I know less well, well, not hardly at all, to be honest with you, but it's an online book on JavaScript. It's probably uh, up to date, but I'm not certain about that. So maybe have a look at it, but that's not the one I would strongly recommend. It's just available for you and it's pretty comprehensive as well as I can see, yeah? This is the one I really like. It's a sort of very sort of nicely written tutorials on JavaScript and it's absolutely bang up to date JavaScript, yeah? So as I'll sort of explain as the module progresses, JavaScript sort of is an evolving language, you introduce new features every year. So if you're looking at a textbook that's five years out of date, it'll be using a fairly ancient version of the language, which is missing a lot of cool stuff, yeah? Whereas the modern JavaScript tutorial is pretty much up to date and you'll find that are often linked to their sections um, in the sort of laboratory sessions, yeah? So as I said, most textbooks are five years out of date and with web development, that's, that's, a, that's a long time, yeah? None of the textbooks I've found cover the range of topics in the course. 
Most stu few students read books on reading lists, which are out of date anyway. So I really haven't, I haven't bothered with a reading list. I think it's a waste of time. Maybe if you're doing philosophy and you're talking about, you know, Julius Caesar or something, then the reading list will be fine. Um, but it's not fine when it comes to technology courses, yeah? So I haven't bothered providing one. Instead, I provide links to online resources, yeah? So if you look at this week, you know, week seven, for example, you've got the videos, lab session, or like Q&A session link. At the bottom, you've got some resources like the Node.js website, a tutorial on Node, and some video tutorials on Node, yeah? So I picked out a few resources that might be helpful as a starting point for supporting the other things we're teaching in the course, yeah? Now, um, I completely understand some people have, you know, visual impairments, some people are dyslexic. So I'm always happy to make module documents available in other formats, yeah? So if you need open dyslexic fonts, different colors, this kind of stuff, just let me know. If you've got special requirements, I'm happy to help. You can either drop into my office hours or drop into the online Q&A session, and we can have a discussion about that, yeah? Now, it's a technology course, so we need software, yeah? Um, so the course website has links to free software you can download and install. So if you're working on your own machine, um, just download and install the software you need. You're going to need Node, MongoDB, VS, Visual Studio Code, maybe a few other bits and bobs, yeah? I've also provided portable versions of the software, the really crucial software, that you can put on a USB stick and run on the lab machines. I've done, done my best with the lab machines provided by the university, but sometimes some bits of software just don't run on them, like running MongoDB on them doesn't really make much sense. And, you know, uh, so, so sometimes it makes more sense to use a portable version that runs on a USB stick. But anything on a USB stick needs to be backed up regularly, yeah? I can't name the number of times students have told me, oh, I lost all my work because my laptop was stolen, my laptop crashed, my USB stick got lost, yeah? If you don't back it up regularly, uh, then you're going to lose stuff guaranteed, yeah? And if you lose stuff, you will not have any sympathy for me because you're second-year computer science students and you need to learn that and learn that fast, yeah? So please back up your work regularly. It's never an excuse not to hand something in. Um, and I'll explain the different software components as the course progresses. You also need a text editor and Windows. I like Notepad++. It's just like for quickly looking at a file and seeing what's in it. Notepad++ is great for that. I recommend Chrome for this course. Strongly recommend against Safari. I mean, you can probably develop on Safari, but I've never had students have particularly good experiences. Uh, Firefox is fine, and there's a few other browsers are probably okay. The most important thing is it needs consistent rendering of the HTML and CSS and it needs to have developer tools, yeah? So Chrome is always a safe choice, yeah? So that's why I recommend Chrome. Visual Studio Code, I strongly recommend as your IDE. Um, there are other ones like WebStorm, which you can get a free license for, but IDE, Visual Studio Code is basically great, and it's written in JavaScript, which is a nice thing, yeah? Okay, so just to quickly give you a quick tour through the course website. Um, I don't know why it's all gone weird. Okay, so this is this is the course website from a sort of student view. So you've got the module handbook, the late submission extenuating circumstances, which maybe cover not in this talk course, but elsewhere. Then a few lectures on blended learning, how basically how the course is taught. These are the recorded, should be recorded, these should be video playlist, change the name of it. And then the online Q&A session. And then, as I said, we've got the software. This is places you can download or use software online and then some portable software for you. Books I mentioned. Here are the sections dedicated to Coursework 1 and Coursework 2, which I'm going to cover a little later in this talk. Um, and then we've got also, and then each week, you've got uh, videos to watch, a laboratory worksheet, which is like practical exercises, which will be helped with in the taught laboratory session, um, and maybe some links to software or tutorials that are appropriate for the laboratory sessions, then the link to the online Q&A session, and then some resources for that that's relevant to this week. Yeah? So you can see here, each week has the same format. We've got the videos, lab sessions, on a Q&A session, and some resources. Yeah? So each week, you should be looking at the appropriate section, and then watching the videos, and then turning up to your lab, to your laboratory session, the taught one on time, and then working through this lab worksheet with help from the teacher. That's the general idea. Yeah. Stupid. OK. Uh, where are we at? Okay. Uh, okay. So this is your course, right? I'm not doing this for my own pleasure, right? I'm doing it because I'm paid to teach you and help you guys to learn this stuff, yeah? So please tell me about things you find difficult or parts of the course that don't work, yeah? Come come and drop, drop in in the online Q&A session, say, well, you know, this is really rubbish, and we'll have a conversation about it. I'm not saying I'm definitely going to change stuff, but I'm always willing to listen, yeah? Drop me an email if you've got something you want to know or you've got a question. 
or make an appointment to come and see me. And please follow in the module evaluation survey. The university runs these surveys to find out what you think of the courses. And so please follow it in and let me know what you think. Yeah? All right. So this course has two assessment components. Yeah, we've got Coursework One, the game website, and Coursework Two, the social networking website. Now this is crucial. Yeah, so each one of these, each piece of coursework is worth half of the marks of the module, and then combined into your overall mark for the module. You need to get forty percent overall to pass the module. Yeah, so the combination of game website and social networking website has to add up to more than forty percent, or you will fail. And you need to also need to get at least 30% in each coursework to pass the module. So it's not enough to just get like an amazing mark, 80% in the game website and not bother with the social networking website. You have to get 30% in each. This has been imposed on me by the university. I don't fully agree with it, but that's what it is and that's what you have to do. Yeah. So please, please, please put some serious effort into both or you're going to reset it and then you're going to have to do it anyway during the reset and you're going to lose mark. Your mark's going to be capped. Yeah. So I strongly recommend that you work hard and get 40% in each piece of coursework and then, or plus 40% plus in each bit of coursework or ideally much more than that so you get a really great mark for the module. And you can know before you submit about what your likely mark will be by talking to us in the labs, in the support sessions, show us your coursework, we'll give you some feedback on it to help you improve it and make sure you're getting at least you know the minimum marks. Yeah. So the game website 50% mark individual project, basically it lets the user play a game, the user has accounts, they can register and log in, and the website has like a rankings table showing the top scores of the users. This is a front-end project implemented in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and the deadline is the end of week six. Second bit of coursework, social networking website, again 50% of the marks. So you can build like a photo sharing, recipe sharing, for sports fans, website, that kind of stuff, yeah? It's a single HTML page for the front-end, that talks to the back end, which is a web service implemented with Node.js and MongoDB. Yeah? Deadlines end of week 12. I'm not going into this in detail here because there are separate documents available on the course website that go into a lot of detail about these pieces of coursework. Yeah? So read these documents carefully before you start the coursework, check your coursework against the marking criteria before you submit it, and if you want to get a good mark, show us your coursework and we'll do a sort of virtual mark in the labs before the deadline and give you some feedback about it. Yeah? And there's also will be separate videos on Coursework 1 and Coursework 2. So this is an example of Coursework 1 description. It changes a little bit each year, so you know don't regard this as like a final one, but it basically goes through the coursework in a great deal of detail, and that will be explained in the appropriate video. Yeah. And then each each coursework specification has the assessment criteria in it, and you can see that this goes into a lot of details about exactly what you've got to do and the marks that are available for doing it. So please, please, please have a look at these coursework descriptions on the course website. And I've also provided marking guidelines for the teachers, yeah? Or teacher staff, whatever, yeah? So these go into even more detail so that we can try and get the most consistent marking that we can across campuses and across teachers, yeah? So these may not be available when you first start the course, but as soon as I've written them, I'll put them up there and you'll be able to see them. Now, both of these pieces of coursework uh, are marked partly through video demonstrations. You, know, you have to submit videos that demonstrate the functionality of your project. These videos are not talking through the code because we've got the code. They're actually showing the website working, showing the web services working, that kind of stuff. Yeah? You're going to lose marks if you don't submit a video demonstration or if you don't show all the code working in your video demonstration. You're getting marks for actually making a website that works and you need to show it working in your video demonstration. Yeah? If you don't do that, we can say, well, the code looks plausible, maybe it's a good attempt, but we'll only give you half marks for it because you haven't shown it working. Yeah? So we're going to, there's a separate uh, video showing how to record video demonstrations in the blended learning section of the course website. So have a look in there. It shows you, you know, I, I use OBS Studio for my recording, explains how that works, talk about bit rates and format and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So to submit your work, you basically zip everything up into a single file. If you don't know how to do that, we can show you in the taught laboratory session or in the support laboratory session, and you upload it in the course website. And we've got a separate sort of video explaining how submission feedback and grading works. How it works is we have these kind of grading forms, and each of these kind of assessment criteria here corresponds to a separate section, and then we'll give you a mark and a brief bit of feedback explaining why you got that mark. Yeah? And so basically you upload it here, um, by the deadline. And there's talk there um, explaining how that works. To pass the module, you need to get 40% overall to, uh, ac across both pieces of coursework, 
and 30% in each coursework as well, yeah? HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are easy to start with, but rapidly become more complex, yeah? It's easy to sketch something, you know, very simple and basic, but when you, as you add features and complexity, if you're not understanding what you're doing and just throwing the code in, it will eventually just break and fail, yeah? If you don't understand JavaScript, you know, properly, it can be quite fiddly to debug, so again, you need to invest the time in learning it properly, rather than just copying bits of code here and there and everywhere and hoping it'll all work, because it won't, yeah? So you really need to watch all the videos, attend the laboratory sessions and do the lab exercises, and then you'll find this much easier and you'll actually make good progress, yeah? And to do that, you've got to spend your own time on the coursework each week. It's not enough to turn up to the four hours of labs and hope to learn all these technologies, because you won't, yeah? You know, the way to learn it is to spend some time on the videos before the labs, spend the time in the labs practicing your stuff with our help, and then spend your time on the coursework again with our help, but also without our help, in order to, you know, work through it, yeah? Advanced warning, coursework two is definitely harder than coursework one. We're introducing web services, we're introducing HTTP, we're introducing MongoDB, yeah? It builds on the skills you develop through coursework one, but if you don't bother working hard on coursework one, you're gonna find coursework two, like you're gonna hit a wall on coursework two. You're gonna have all this stuff thrown at you and you're, you know, you're not gonna know what to do, yeah? So you need to put sustained effort into it over 12 weeks, yeah? You've got roughly 20 hours per week on this module if you're a full-time student and you need to spend pretty much close to that if you want to pass the module and get, well, definitely if you want to get a good mark for it, yeah? And there's, you know, a bit of a tendency among some students to just rush for deadlines, yeah? But that's just not going to work, yeah? You, you know, you're going to have two deadlines probably in week six, one from this module and one from the other module. If you try and, like, get it all done in a week, that's never going to happen, I can guarantee you, particularly with coursework two. So you need to work on it steadily over the six weeks and then you'll be fine and we can help you with that, yeah? Final thing I want to say is about the use of AI tools, right? Wall, you know, AI is sort of buzzword at the moment kind of thing. And it's undoubtedly a powerful tool that can increase programmer productivity. But note, note the phrasing here, it can increase product, programmer productivity, but it's not very likely to have completely replace programmers anytime soon. Yeah, the sort of AWS talk in April was talking about like 40% increase in productivity. That's not 100%, that's 40%, yeah? As time goes on, AI is likely to play an increasingly important role in the workplace. It can automate a lot of stuff, it can replace some stuff, but the most important role it's going to have, really, in my opinion, is supporting and helping with, with stuff. It's like a spell checker on Word, right? You know, that helps you check your spelling, but it's not writing your text for you, yeah? Now, in this module, you're very welcome to use AI tools like GitHub, Copilot, uh, ChatGPT, AWS Code Whisperer to help you write code for your course work. These are powerful tools, you know, with some of them you can write a comment and it'll fill in a suggestion about the code that matches the comment, for example, yeah? You're also welcome to use text generation tools like ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot to help you write your reports. Again, you could say, well, I've got to, you know, summarize, you know, this or whatever. They're not probably going to help you that much, but if you want to use them, you can use them and, you know, that's fine, yeah? But this is a really important point, okay? They can help you to program more efficiently, but they're not going to do the coursework for you, yeah? You know, because AI tools frequently make mistakes, and they don't really understand the technology requirements, the broader context, of, uh, you know, of what's going on with the project. They don't understand the coursework descriptions very well either, yeah? So if you just, you know, use AI to generate the code and report for you without having a clue about how the technologies works, um, you're almost certainly going to get a low mark and probably fail, yeah? So if you want to get a good mark or even pass this module, I recommend this approach, yeah? You need to understand how HTML, CSS, JavaScript, HTTP, and so on actually work, yeah? Then to learn how they work, it's not about, it's not a theoretical understanding. You actually need to be able to write code with these technologies without the help of AI, yeah? You know, start by learning them properly and being able to write code yourself with these technologies. Then, Great, you know, they can then use AI to help you to generate drafts of pieces of code for your project. You can say, okay, write me a, you know, web service endpoint that does registration, for example, with MongoDB. Maybe it'll generate, and then maybe it'll generate something that's half good, and then you can actually then edit it, uh, that code. You can then test the code yourself. You can integrate it with the other pieces of code and fix bugs in it, yeah? But, you know, you won't be able to get from the third stage to the fourth stage without actually understanding the technologies, yeah? If you don't understand how the JavaScript works, how Node and Express works, how MongoDB works, then you might have a brilliant, you know, draft of this, but it won't match the coursework requirements probably, and you won't be able to fix any bugs in it or test it or integrate it with the rest. This step from here to here 
depends on you having the knowledge about these technologies in order to be able to take the suggestion from AI and turn it into something that is actually going to get you some marks. Yeah. This is summarized in section 6.4 of the module handbook. So take a look there if you, if you want the sort of full statement about that. Yeah. Okay, so this lecture has introduced CST 2120. Um, I use a blended learning approach in this module. There's a separate video in the blended learning section of the course website on that. Yeah. Please read the crosswork specifications carefully and follow the deadlines because if you miss the deadlines, there's a sort of graded approach, but you will you will basically just lose a lot of marks. Yeah. Please look carefully at the marking criteria. If you don't follow the required technology and some of the technology specs in there, you will again lose marks or get zero marks. Yeah. All of this is unavailable on the course website. You should use this as sort of the guiding sort of core, the, you know, the guide for this module and you know follow what I'm asking you to do each week. Yeah. You've got to read all these kind of things carefully, pay attention to them. If you don't, you're just going to lose marks and fail. Yeah. When it comes to AI tools, think of it as a knowledgeable but fairly stupid assistant. Okay. It knows a lot of stuff, AI. It's absorbed, you know, the entire web basically and all the code written on the web, but it doesn't really know what you're trying to do with it. Um, and it might chuck out a load of junk that isn't very appropriate. Yeah. So you can use the output from AI only if you understand the technologies yourself. Yeah, then you can say, well, this sucks, this is a bad bit of code AI suggested, or great bit of code, but it needs to be fixed here. And you know, and you also need to be able to understand technologies in order to be actually run and test the code. Yeah, just you know, submitting a load of code doesn't work, is not going to get you any marks in this project, yeah, in this coursework. Yeah. So it's a it's a knowledgeable, fairly stupid assistant. Work with that assistant if you like, but but please, please, please understand what you're doing, or that work is going to be fairly hopeless. Yeah. Okay, and have have fun with the module, as I've emphasized before, and that's it.